Hi friends, as many of you know, I was a second generation Jehovah's Witness and escaped after more than two decades. So today what I would like to do is I would like to explore one of their most important claims. So let's get right to it. The Jehovah's Witness most important claim is that Jesus Christ examined all of the religious institutions on the earth and chose the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the governing body, as his faithful and discreet slave. And this occurred in 1919. They claim that in doing so, Watchtower became God's sole channel of communication through which a person can gain eternal life. I'd like to explore the teachings of the Watchtower organization in and around 1919 when Jesus Christ supposedly chose them as the faithful and discreet slave. And I really would like to see what was so great about the organization that Jesus chose them because I really want to know how Jesus deemed them to be so worthy to be the provider of the spiritual food at the proper time. This article says by the end of 1919, Jehovah's people in the box, Jehovah's people had been released from their symbolic captivity to Babylon the Great, and Jesus had appointed the faithful and discreet slave. This is in the October 2019 Watchtower, just really a few months ago. I would like you to take a look here at the July 15th, 2013 Watchtower, an article entitled Feeding Many Through the Hands of a Few. This article wants the reader to connect Jesus feeding the multitudes to the faithful and discreet slave handing out the food at the proper time. But what kind of food are they really distributing? Look at this picture, friends. The picture speaks a thousand words. It says the anointed or other sheep would have a steady supply of timely spiritual food. You know, I saw this phrase many times, timely spiritual food. And I actually looked for the word accurate. In all of these articles that I scanned through, I saw timely spiritual food, but I never saw the word accurate spiritual food. Don't you think that if Jesus was choosing, was choosing God's spokesmen, on earth, he would want them to be accurate because, you know, the prophets in the Bible, they never got it wrong. The November 15th, 2014 Watchtower shed some light on what had happened at that time, and it talks about the two witnesses as discussed in Revelation chapter 11. So I'm going to put the words of Revelation chapter 11 and, and a few of the verses on the screen. Pause the video because it's kind of long. So many supernatural things happen with these two witnesses. They prophesy on the earth for 1,260 days and fire comes out of their mouth and consumes their enemies. I consider this a, a literal event that is going to happen. They stop the rain as Elijah did, and they turn the waters into blood as Moses did, and they also smite the earth with plagues. And they, they get killed, and they lay in the street for like three days, and you think of like a live cam, the scripture says people are making merry and giving gifts like like it's Christmas time. You know, they're happy, they're late. They get resurrected and, and people freak out. You know, it says fear comes over all the people. And then they get taken up to heaven in... in um, in a whirlwind, like, like, a, like a rapture, kind of like Elijah did. So anyway, that's Revelation 11, the story of the two witnesses. They prophesy on the earth 1,260 days. So now I want to go back to the November 15th, 2014 Watchtower to show why this is relevant. Under the title, Who Are the Two Witnesses Mentioned in Revelation Chapter 11? <clears throat> the article goes on to say that it was Rutherford and his pals. Remember when they were thrown into prison in, in 1918? It says at the end of their preaching in sackcloth, these anointed ones were symbolically killed when they were thrown into prison for a compar comparatively shorter period of time, a symbolic three and a half days. And in the bo box on the bottom, it says that they were anointed as the members of the faithful and discreet slave. So the end of this article states that Jehovah arranged for a spiritual refining work to cleanse a special people for fine works. Wow, 
These people must have been absolutely amazing, thrown into prison for preaching the good news. Well, I don't think so. A. H. McMillan was a very, very faithful Jehovah's Witness. He wrote Faith on the March in 1957. Nathan Knorr, uh, who was a former Watchtower president, performed his funeral. He's buried in uh, one of the organization's burial plots. I mean, he was really, really a high up, and I think he might, might have even been in prison with Rutherford. Anyway, he chronicled the history of the organization and speaks in great depth about the imprisonment. You see, these men were not imprisoned for preaching Jehovah's kingdom. And in Macmillan's book, he tells why. He says that they were charged under the 1917 Espionage Act of attempting to cause insubordination, disloyalty, refusal of duty in the armed forces, and obstructing the recruitment and enlistment service of the U.S. while it was at war. Macmillan wrote in his book that the Attorney General had written that one of the most dangerous examples of this sort of propaganda is the book, The Finished, Minis the Finished Mystery. This is archived in the Congressional Record. The book, which was erroneously published as a posthumous work of Pastor Russell, is considered extremist. Posthumous means after death. So right there in the front of the book, it says the posthumous work of Pastor Russell, but it was not. You see, when I was a Jehovah's Witness, we were always told that Rutherford and his friends were put into prison because they were Jehovah's Witnesses and they were preaching the good news, but they weren't. They were considered extremists, just as the Jehovah's Witness organization is considered extremist in Russia today. So tell me, friends, why would Jesus choose these men to be the faithful and discreet slave? How can they be considered the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11? They don't even come on the earth until the tribulation period. They were considered extremists. That's why they went to prison. They were not persecuted for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, as will be the two witnesses they preached. 1,260 days. So if the society's current doctrinal truth is used as the standard, however, then this claim is suspect since much of what the society taught before, during, and even after 1919 was later rejected by the society as erroneous. 1919 is a really big year, friends. You may not notice, you may not know it, but it is. That's when they were considered the faithful and discreet slave. So what I'd like to do <clears throat> is I would like to examine a few of the teachings from 1919 when Jesus came and chose them and cleansed them. So I didn't know where to start. I just went to the January 1st, 1919 Watchtower and it didn't take me long. Right on the front page, it states that Pastor Russell was commissioned of our Lord to warn the wicked that they should surely die. They quote Ezekiel 3, but Ezekiel was a prophet to the Hebrews who were captives in Babylon in around like 600 BC. What does Ezekiel chapter 3, preaching to the captives, have to do with us today? And why would the Lord commission Pastor Russell to warn the people that they were going to die when we were commissioned to make disciples and preach the gospel of Christ? And anyway, why would the Lord want him to tell people they were going to die in 1919? Do the math. This is 2020. Doesn't make any sense at all. Matthew 28, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He doesn't tell us to tell people that they're going to die. We're not to tell people they're going to die. May 15th, 1919, Watchtower, page 159. Christ returned invisibly in 1874, calculated from the Great Pyramid measurements. 
Now, why would Christ cleanse and choose an organization to be God's sole channel if they were conferring with the occult to set dates? Have you heard of pyramidology? It's an occult practice. But in 1924, it still appears that they were using the occult practice of pyramidology. There is a book called The Way to Paradise. And wait a minute, I thought Jesus cleansed this organization. In this book, they called the, the pyramid the Bible in stone. It states, the pyramid outlines the same plan of God we find in the Bible. This book was published by the International Bible Students, friends. Well, I can tell you it's not the God of the Bible's plan written in stone. The God of the Bible's plan is written in the Holy Bible and the Holy Bible alone, sola scriptura, scripture alone. He doesn't teach us through publications and he doesn't teach us through the measurements of the Great Pyramid. But that's what they were teaching then, right after Jesus supposedly cleansed the organization. So let's just jump back to 1920 and see what was going on. Well, yeah, Rutherford's millions now living will never die. Well, this is 2020, do the math. But he confidently taught, amongst many other things, that the faithful prophets of old would be resurrected in 1925. Scriptures definitely fix the fact over there on the right that these faithful ones would be resurrected and fully restored to perfect humanity. Now let me ask you, out of all of the Christians on the earth, why would Jesus choose an organization run by Rutherford or Russell? It doesn't make sense. Listen, friends, God is not working through an earthly organization. That's a lie that's found in the Jehovah's Witness publications. It's not found in the Bible. Why do you think they want you to study their literature? Why do you think they tell you that you can't understand the Bible alone? The Catholic Church tells the Catholics the same thing because they want them to believe Catholic doctrine. I want you to take a look at this clip by governing body member Jeffrey Jackson. Do you see yourselves as Jehovah God's spokespeople on earth? Uh, that, I think, would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Uh, the, clear, the scriptures clearly show uh, that uh, someone can act in harmony with God's Spirit in uh, giving comfort and help in the congregations. But uh, if I could just clarify a little, going back to Matthew 24... Uh, clearly, Jesus said that in the last days, and Jehovah's Witnesses believe these are the last days, there would be a slave, a group of persons who would have responsibility to care for the spiritual food. So in that respect, uh, we view ourselves as trying to fulfill that role. They're not even inspired by God, friends, and he even says it in a court. They're lying to you. They want you to believe that they are going to take you through the tribulation but they're not. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's 1 Timothy 2. Where is the presence of the governing body in this scripture? Acts chapter 4. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Putting your faith and trust in the governing body is only going to lead you to destruction. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the only way to salvation. He's the only name by which men must be saved. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. It's all about Jesus, friends. It's not about Jehovah. It's not about the governing body. It's a matter of a simple prayer between you and God. Pray to him. Cry out to him. Even if you don't know how to pray, because the Holy Spirit will intercede for you, just tell him what's on your heart. Romans chapter 8 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Do it today, friends. Replace Watchtower Lies with the truth, the truth from Scripture. So I hope you enjoyed this today. 
I hope I shed some light on <laughs> the lie. And I do have another little dog here today named Bella. She's visiting me. I hope I shed some light on the lie about the faithful and discreet slave being chosen in 1919. There's just absolutely no way. I hope you enjoyed this. If you like what I do, please like and subscribe to my channel. Check out my Facebook channel as well. I share a lot of truth in there. And if you like what I do and would like to support me, please check out the link in the description of this video. Thank you so much for watching today, friends, and I hope you have a great day.